Donna, thank you uh, so much for being with us tonight. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. This is great. Uh, Yes, I, and, and I just wanted to say, you know, uh, this is virtual. Obviously, you lose a little bit, uh, you know, being remote, but uh, that was an incredible performance. And I do say performance. I, I feel I got so much of that through the screen, and I, I can't imagine what the opportunity to see you live must be like. So uh, definitely look forward to that uh, once we're able to do so. Um, I just wanted to start off, you know, in one of the details that you mentioned, you say that you were teaching and sharing stories in schools. Um, what kind of stories do you share in schools? What is your involvement in schools? And, you know, what's that audience like for you as a performer? Well, I work with everyone from kindergarten all the way up to university. So um, I, what I mostly do in schools is I do socially appropriate and emotionally and educationally appropriate material. So for the week I was up in the mountains, I was doing Chaucer for the high school doing um, some personal narrative. Um, it, it's, it, it really depends on the age groups, but a lot more mature type stories, not a lot of uh, folklore. And I imagine, uh, obviously, that, you know, there's quite a bit different. Every audience uh, has its own sort of pros and cons. Do you have a particular favorite or a, a, a group uh, that you particularly look forward to or that, you know, the approach that they call for is, is really, uh, you know, what you're interested in? I really enjoy telling stories to high school students because they don't know that they like them. And sometimes they come and they're like, he, he, he. And I tell really scary stories to high school because I love the smell of frightened children in the morning. But mostly it's because they refine a love of stories. And by the end, I can tell them anything. Sometimes I tell them little bitty silly stories by the end and they're cheering, they love it. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. At high school, Weird time, I can't recall any period in my life where I was so confident about everything and knew so little, um, <laughs> but uh, I do cherish that time, the memory, so I, I can't imagine uh, oh, what that what that's like. That's fantastic. And just generally, and I'm sure this applies to you know every different group that you might come in front of, what do you think is the power of uh, storytelling? You know, that's the sort of question that we always like to ask the people that we have here on Stories from the Stage because everybody's approach tends to be very different. What draws you to do this and what do you think can be most well accomplished with storytelling. One of my favorite saying is it's, it's hard to hate someone if you know their story. So for me, what storytelling about is about is building community between people. I can come into a group and, um, well, example, I go into a library, say in really teeny towns and a whole bunch of people come because there are no black people in the town and they've come to stare. And little boy came in at one point and was like, oh my gosh, she's black. And then the parent was really embarrassed that he would say that, but they sat right there and stared at me. And then I tend to tell folklore from the area. And before it's done, I'm everybody's aunt, cousin, grandma. And um, I hear people telling the stories that the versions they know to children, to each other as they leave the room. And by the time I'm gone, everyone wants to hug me and they've had a great time. And you just build community. And it doesn't matter what the audience is like, where they've come from, you build community when you share stories. And I think that's the power of it, connecting us all together. Absolutely, fantastic insight. And I, I could not agree more. I mean, it sounds almost Hallmarkian, almost trite when you say, it, like, you know, you can't hate someone if, you, if you've heard the story, but I do find that to be true. I think the internet and the current political climate, you know, there are convictions I have, uh, absolutely, which are, I will never bend on. And if you come at me presenting opposite of that, I'm going to, tend to be, you know, very standoffish. At the same time, I have seen and do believe that if you put a bunch of people in a room and you don't let them talk about politics, religion, or anything of that sort, and just here you are, where you come from, what's going on with you, uh, you will often get somewhere that you never would have before. So, um, you know, that is important to re remember uh, while everybody is on all the social medias, you know, <laughs> getting angry every day. Uh, so absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, you spend time with teenagers. I understand that high schoolers are, are a group that you particularly, um, you know, look forward to, to being in front of. Uh, I remember that stage of my life. And I remember specifically not being able to vote, but having a lot of ideas. And do you see that students who are, are not yet of age to vote, do they come uh, with political convictions, personal convictions, you know, is, is that stuff really well-developed? Do they express that in the stories that they share with you? 
Well, a, a lot of people vote the way their parents voted, right? So if you grow up in a, a home where there's a particular bent conservative or liberal, you tend to vote that way when you get your chance to do it because those are, you know, despite what we say about our friends, those are the major influences in your life. And um, a lot of young people, well, they, in our state, North Carolina, they start letting kids vote, like in the kids voting poll, when they're in second grade. So if you're in our state, you've been voting like that for a while. And by the time you get to high school, you have thoughts about what you think is right and what's wrong. So I think a lot of kids, at least the ones I've met, have really strong convictions, though sometimes they don't know why they have those convictions. Uh, and as they learn more, sometimes they part with their families and sometimes they, you know, believe, yes, this is what I need to do. So, yeah, I think that they're baked enough to be able to see some things. And you don't know what you're going to do in a voting booth. I know people have done this forever. You go and you think you're going to go one way and you actually vote some way other than you thought. So, you know, I'm not sure that we're as baked after years. It just depends on what's going on. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember that well, you know, that's a big moment in your life when you, if this happens for everyone, no matter what, you know, political stripe you happen to be, it's, you have seen and heard your parents say one thing forever. And then at one point you're an adult and you just sitting around one day and you realize, I don't think I believe in that. <laughs> and, and, that and that is, that is a, a major moment. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I did want to ask, you know, your story was so powerful. I mean, uh, you really just took us in so many different emotional avenues. And I just want to ask, towards the end, when you had that comment thrown at you in the breakfast room, and you say, you know, it's a new America, do you believe, do you feel that it is still a new America, contra to, you know, what you felt at that point in that room? Do you still have that hope, uh, both in uh, the electoral process and, and just the, the situation in general? Yes. And I do because... I really feel like we made a kind of interesting turn. As a country, there's a lot of things we don't talk about. We're not, you know, you don't bring it up in polite company. It's going to cause problems. But those very things that we're not allowed to talk about, we need to talk about those things. You can't get through them unless you can talk about them. And we just had one president prior to this one who got a lot of flack no matter what he did for things that everyone else had done. And we've got a president now who's done stuff nobody else has done and an entire portion of the population is perfectly fine with that. There's a lot of swinging back and forth, but I think that on the other side of the swing, we have made more progress. Black women didn't get to vote until 1965. White women didn't get to vote until 1920. Most people didn't get to vote in 1776 when we founded the country. We take teeny little steps. Now, granted, we run backwards five yards for every teeny little step we make, but we continue to make them. And when you know, we look back in 10 years, we'll say, wow, who thought we were gonna get through this place? But we will be further along. So I think people want that, and I think people vote for that, and I think people want it even if they're doing something right now that might be a little crazy. Mm. So I always have hope. I hope is the way to go. Uh, you know, I think, and I try to live by, and uh, I really do appreciate that answer. And we appreciate your story so much. Thank you so much, uh, Donna Washington, for being with us tonight. That was a fantastic story. I encourage everybody to please check her out online and uh, see where she's performing digitally. And once this is all improved uh, in person as well. Thank you, Donna.